And good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. I appreciate so very, very much you being with me here. Uh, my name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Arden World, Oklahoma. And uh, this is my Friday session, obviously. And on Fridays, I, I really call my session Responding to the Critics, because uh, on Fridays, I generally do book reviews. I look at articles. I look at uh, videos that have been posted by people who oppose covenant eschatology, who oppose the truth of the full preterist position. And so we're currently involved in a review of the book, The Future of Rome. And this book, as I've shared with you earlier, was recommended to, to me uh, by Derek Lambert, uh, who was once a believer in the full preterist view, was once a Christian, he claimed, and um, now is an atheist. And so he now rejects the idea that Revelation had anything to do with Jerusalem or AD 70. And as I've shared with you, he initially said that he would have me on his show and we would have a conversation, not a debate, but a conversation about the dating and application of the book of Revelation. I said, that's just fine, but he changed his mind. And instead, he recommended this book, claiming that this book would refute anything that I might have to say about an application of the book of Revelation to Jerusalem before AD 70. Okay. <clears throat> so as I've shared with you, and look, it's been a couple of weeks since I was with you, so I feel it necessary to kind of go back over this territory. I've shared with you that really all the way up to chapter 11, which begins on page 206, the book really has nothing to do, literally nothing, to do with the dating of Revelation or its application. It's fascinating stuff to be sure. It's historical information, and it's interesting. But it has no relevance whatsoever to help us determine What's the book of Revelation about? When was it written? Zero. But then we come to chapter 11, and the author is Peter Oakes, a scholar. I've already shared with you that Mr. Oakes completely, totally, 100% ignores, as if the evidence was not even there, several foundational elements of the book of Revelation that are in the text and he acts as if they're not there. Now, on, on page 208 and 209, he, he begins to present his case for believing, as he says at the top of the page on page 208, there are many points in the text of Revelation 17, specifically, that suggest that John specifically has Rome in mind, unquote. And again, that's page 208. Now, what I find really, really interesting is that Mr. Oakes makes no mention of how Revelation 14 serves as part of the background for chapter 17. If you believe that, I, as I do, that Revelation is recapitulatory in, in its nature. In other words, you have a vision here that gives certain details. Then the vision continues at a later period in the book of Revelation, in the apocalypse, and you have different aspects of the vision that are shared, different nuances, different information, but it's still dealing with the same vision. Well, that's the way it is with chapter 14 and chapter 17. Chapter 14 is talking about Babylon. Chapter 17 is talking about Babylon. So unless Mr. Oaks would want to argue that chapter 17 is sequential and follows chapter 14, and I don't know if he does or not, to be honest about it, because like I said, he literally ignores chapter 14. 
And you have to ask yourself the question, why is that? Well, I'm being judgmental. You'll, you'll excuse me. But it's my assessment that the reason that Mr. Oaks ignored chapter 14 is because it gives us some information to help us understand chapter 17 is not about Rome. And Mr. Oaks makes some, I think, some egregious exegetical errors in delineating, seemingly so, between chapter 14 and chapter 17. Now, I say delineating because he doesn't say, now, I believe chapter 17 is different, etc. He doesn't say that. He just begins with chapter 17. So his very first argument to prove that Babylon was Rome is that Rome, chapter 17, talks about this great city and there are seven kings, seven mountains, which are seven kings. And he says, after all, what we find in first century history, even before the first century, Rome was described as the city that sat on seven hills. Well, guess what? I don't deny that. It is interesting that Mr. Oaks takes note of the fact that numerous scholars have pointed out that Jerusalem also sat on seven hills. Now, I'm not making that argument. I just want you to know I am not arguing that Babylon sat on seven hills. As a matter of fact, pardon me, I am delineating between Babylon and the beast, and it's the beast that had the seven heads and the seven horns, which represent the seven kings. And they're the ones who sat on the seven hills. Kenneth Gentry points this out very, very well, by the way, very effectively, very powerfully in his book, Before Jerusalem Fell. That book is available through my website. I highly, highly recommend that book. So what Gentry does is he points out that in chapter 17, you have Babylon, the woman, and then you have the beast. They are not the same entity. And it's the beast that technically sets on the seven hills. Now, could you extrapolate from that and say, well, Babylon therefore set on the seven hills? Well, that's a stretch because there is a clear-cut delineation between Babylon and the beast in chapter 17. Here's what I mean. In chapter 17, there is what I call a persecutorial partnership or a partnership of persecution between this great harlot woman, this Babylon, the unfaithful bride, as we've already seen, the bride who broke the marriage covenant, and that cannot be Rome in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And let, let me remind you of this, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. I pointed out in the first few videos in this series that Mr. Oaks completely, totally, 100% ignores the Old Testament background and source of the identity of Babylon. Unless I've missed it. Secondly, he ignores what Sebastian Smilars in his book, The Metaphor of Marriage, in the book of Revelation, that the language that is used in the book of Revelation to describe this harlot woman is taken from the Old Testament and refers to a woman who had broken the marriage vow, the marriage covenant. Well, folks, that cannot be Rome. Rome was never in a marriage relationship with Yahweh. Never. Thirdly, it ignores the fact that the city of Babylon in the book of Revelation had killed the Old Testament prophets, and guess what? Rome never killed even one Old Testament prophet, period. Number two, it is, quote, where the Lord was crucified, Revelation 11, 8. 
Well, guess what? Rome is not, quote, where the Lord was crucified, unquote. So all of these facts militate against Mr. Oak's, Oak's position that Rome was Babylon, and yet he completely, 100% ignores all of this. Now, he talks about Rome being the city guilty of the blood of the martyrs, but that's anachronistic, as I've already pointed out. So here's the point to return to this, all right? In the book of Revelation, chapter 17, you have the woman, the city of Babylon, the harlot. It is this city that the woman represents that is riding on the beast. She is not the beast. She is separate and distinct from the beast. Now, watch what happens in Revelation chapter 17. And this is not my normal Bible, so I don't remember where it's at on the page to start. <laughs> okay. Now, notice in Revelation chapter 17, and I, I'm going to begin reading. Uh, let me see here. Where do we start? Verse four, the woman. Now, remember, the woman is riding the beast. The beast is not the woman. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and, a, and of the unclean things of her immorality. Now, let me ask you a question. Why does that have to refer exclusively to Rome? Every word here, every single word applied very aptly to Old Covenant Jerusalem. But to continue, upon her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw, I wondered at her greatly. Now, digression. If the book of Revelation was written under Domitian, okay, 95 AD, the late date, then that means that Rome had persecuted the saints for one four-year period of time from 64 to 68 AD under Nero. One four-year period of time. And you may go, well, wait a minute, Domitian persecuted the church. No. Folks, there is extremely, extremely little evidence that Rome, or excuse me, that Domitian ever persecuted the church. In my book, Who Is This Babylon? I document from, listen, I document it from late date advocates, from people who have argued historically that Domitian is the beast. Domitian is Rome, in other words. And yet they're admitting, and I'm talking about men such as Donald Guthrie in his massive tome, Introduction to the New Testament, and he says the evidence for a Diocle uh, excuse me, Domitianic persecution of the church is not nearly as strong as once believed. Richard Nywanger, first century church historian, said there is virtually no evidence of any persecution of the church, any persecution of the church by Domitian, much less any kind of a systematic persecution. And I've got quote after quote after quote in this book. Now, if you go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, and if you order the book, Who's This Babylon? If you will make a mention that you saw the offer on YouTube or Facebook, I'll refund your shipping. That'll save you $6.95, or it may be $7.95. We had to go up on the rates. Anyway, just mention that you saw the offer on YouTube or Facebook. Order this book, this, my book, Who Is This Babylon, has been positively re re reviewed, peer-reviewed in the Russian Academy of Sciences. The reviewer said it's a trage tragedy that this book will not be uh, distributed more than it probably will be. I agree with that. But he says the book makes a powerful, powerful case 
for the early dating of the book of Revelation and that period of time and its application to the fall of Jerusalem. So get yourself a copy of the book. So anyway, Mr. Oaks ignores all of that testimony and the fact that if Revelation was written under Domitian, there had only been one, only one persecution of the church by Rome, and that's under Nero a four-year period of time. So here's the question. Are we supposed to believe that Rome filled up the measure of her sin and that she fits the uh, description excuse me, of being drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus in four years? Because you see, folks, many, many scholars believe, and they do not believe, that the Neronian persecution spread outside the confines of the city of Rome at all. I'm not sure I would accept that argument, but that's a scholarly view nonetheless. So once again, the question is, are we supposed to believe that Rome filled up the measure of her sin, as Revelation chapter 17, verse 6 describes it, and her cup is full of the blood of the martyrs of Christ, and she did that in four years in opposition to Jerusalem that Jesus said that in her generation, she was going to fill up all of the blood of all the righteous from righteous Abel unto Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom they slew between the temple and the altar. Folks, that's millennia of persecution of the saints. So which, which one better fits the description? A city that had persecuted God's servants for centuries or a city that had persecuted or that persecuted the saints for one four-year period of time? And then you, you have to ask that question. Okay. I found this uh, on the web uh, for that. Okay, boy, well, how in the world did that happen? Okay, my, that... my computer tried to talk to me there. <laughs> Did Domitian even persecute the church? Well, the evidence is really, really scant, and I, I document it in this book. Who is this Babylon? So, to reiterate, are we supposed to believe that Rome fits the bill of being drunken with the blood of the saints through one persecution, the Neronian persecution, that was confined to one city, perhaps, and that Domitian never even persecuted the church. Some of the examples that are often given turn out to be not even supportive of any kind of Christian persecution. I won't go into that. So we continue. Uh oh, sorry about that. Here's this woman. It's the woman, the harlot, Babylon, that is drunken with the blood. Okay, verse seven, and the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I shall tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the 10 horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder whose name was not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not, and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Well, how does she sit on those mountains? By riding the beast. The mountains are not her, quote, natural abode. She sits on the mountains because she rides the beast. Now watch this. And they... That's the seven heads, the seven mountains. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is and has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. Now watch this. And the beast which was and is not is, is himself is of, the, of an eighth and is of the seven and he goes to destruction. And the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings which have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These, these ten horns, will wage war against the lamb, 
and the lamb will overcome them. And because he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and those who are with him are, are, the, are the called, the chosen, the faithful. Now watch this. And the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes of nations and tongues. Now here's what I wanted to get to, all right? And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate and burn her with fire and eat her flesh. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose, by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. And the woman which you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now I'll get to that terminology later. Here's what we have. We have the woman and we have the beast. The woman sits on the beast and thus sits on the seven hills. But the woman and the beast have this persecution. They have one mind to persecute the saints. But then, did you catch it? Did you catch the power of this? These, the ten horns, will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Now, the one very quick point here, that terminology of burning her with fire is the priestly, is, is the punishment for the wife of a priest who broke the marriage bond. David Shilton points this out magnificently in his book, Days of Vengeance. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If, and this is a humongous if, if the book of Revelation was written under Domitian, then who, what entity was Domitian ever in a partnership of persecution against the church? Folks, this is critical. It's a question that's got to be asked. New, several, several years ago, I was giving a presentation at a lectureship, and I pointed out this, this partnership of persecution. And I developed this in my book, Who is This Babylon? And there was a, a well-seasoned minister in the audience. And when I pointed out that in Revelation 17, you have a partnership of persecution, but the beast turns on the woman and destroys her, burns her with fire, slays her. This minister nearly came up out of his pew, and he came up to me afterwards, and he said, you know, Don, I thought I'd he heard everything about the book of Revelation. He said, I have never, ever, ever seen what you were talking about in regard to the partnership of persecution between the woman and the beast. Here's the point. Neither Rome or Domitian. You've got to catch the power of this, folks. Domitian was never, ever in any kind of a partnership with anyone to persecute the church. Now, remember, we have every right in the world to question whether or not Domitian ever even persecuted the church. We therefore have even more reason to question and to challenge the idea of whether or not he was ever in a partnership with any entity to persecute the church. I mean, after all, he, he was not in a, in a partnership with Rome to persecute the church. He is the personification of Rome. Furthermore, Domitian did not hate Rome, and he did not slay Rome. He did not burn Rome. But here's the point. Nero and Rome were in a partnership of persecution against the church. Do you realize that the entirety of Nero's inner circle of counselors and advisors, and by the way, including his wife, Papea, his active 
powerful influencers, Acti and others, everyone in his circle of advisors were Jews. Guess who Paul and Peter died under? Nero. And whose advice? Well, Adolf Horneck, great historian, said many years ago that the evidence suggests, number one, there was an ambassador from Jerusalem that traveled to Rome to get Nero to kill Paul and Peter. So who was it that was influencing Nero to persecute the church? Many scholars believe that it was the Jews when, when Nero set fire to Rome and he needed a scapegoat, many scholars believe that it was the Jews said, hey, look over there at the Christians. That, you know, blame them. But you see, that partnership of persecution in which Rome authorized the Jews to persecute the church, supported the Jews in their persecution of the church, what happened? Jerusalem rebelled. And Rome turned on her and destroyed her and burned her with fire. Folks, that's the historical reality. That's the historical reality that fits Revelation chapter 17. Instead of proposing that Babylon was Rome, because of the seven hills. So once again, did Babylon set on seven hills? Well, representatively, yes, by riding the beast. And it's the beast itself that set on the seven hills. Here is Babylon. Here's the beast. Here's the seven, here, here's the seven hills. No other city was ever, no other entity was ever in a partnership with Rome to persecute the, the church. And that partnership then dissolved and Rome destroyed this other city. And remember, Babylon is a city. So you have, you have evidence here that an identity of Rome as Babylon does not work. Does Mr. Oaks say one word about such a partnership or persecution? No, not even one. Not a word. I consider that to be a gross, gross exegetical and hermeneutical oversight. I consider it likewise to be a fatal oversight in Mr. Oaks' representation of Babylon as Rome. Hey, thanks for joining me for this morning's Morning Musings and our review of the future of Rome. Be sure to join me tonight as I rejoin Mike Sullivan, my good friend, as we continue our study of Preterist Apologetics. Thanks again for joining me. I'll see you there.